there was a stream uh, going down behind these cottages, and uh, the uh, people who stars meet, there was a, a pump, yeah. you know, a large pump just down the road, and they used to all, oh, all meet there the to here. chat and that, you know. This was my dad, Jim Cassidy, being interviewed in 2011 by writer Samantha Labrary for the book Fingless, The People's Portrait, that she produced with photographer Darren Kinsella. Dad was recalling moving into our house, Site 12 North Road, in the 1950s, just before the farmlands that stretched as far as the eye could see were buried beneath the Dublin Corporation housing estates of Fingless West. It seems likely that the old Finglassians gathered around the pump across the road at the cottages of the watery lane would have had a lot to say about those housing schemes that turned their village into a concrete Dublin suburb in just a few short years. Fingless exploded then. It started to explode the population. Dublin was inside the canals. Like, that Fingless out in the country. We were cultures out here. It made a town out of the village, you know, because all the new shops and all that opened up and uh, it made more people available for different projects in the in the, the town. So everybody was welcome and we created jobs for bread men, milk men, road sweepers, everything it was all more work. I don't know whether there was anybody that didn't agree with them coming out. They came in from town and a few of them saying, oh God, all oh, these town is coming in now, look at all oh, these, and they don't know, you know, not cutting the grass right. <laughs> they didn't know what the countryside was like. So they were mesmerised and they'd come all the way down. But my father, the Lord of had a big garden going around to Power City. The wall is still there. But every morning we used to come down, cabbages would be gone. We ended up, we had nothing. The kids used to wait until dark. From the, from the west, and they'd come down and they'd get all the vegetables for the mother and then they'd go back up again. Now, we knew they were doing it, but it was because they were from town, you know, and this was country to them, you know what I mean? The attitudes of the locals to the newcomers was one thing, but for the new arrivals, most of whom had known nothing but Dublin's inner city until they were rehoused in the new housing estates of Finglas, with little or no amenities to support them, it was something of a culture shock. Mam came out to Finglas. She was only 19 when she came out to Finglas. They were forced, they got house in Kildonan Drive. I think they were built there, she was saying, in 19. And she was Linda, God, when we come out here, she said to me, I was a comfy riddance, she said. I couldn't believe that. I felt a bit cranky, she says to me. And I used people coming out from town. There were just a couple of shops in the village, that's all. There was a small, maybe one or two small, like country shops. Sold a bit of everything, do you know that kind of way? The bus only came to the village then and you had to walk. Wherever you lived after that, you had to walk. It was, it was difficult, very difficult. My mother had had her fourth child. You needed to have four children before you got a corporation house. So my brother Eamon uh, was born in 1958 in February and we moved out here in April 58. Uh, This area, Wellmount, was established at that stage. The houses had been built about two years earlier. And uh, I actually remember... uh, coming out on the bus uh, a few days before we did the actual move. Uh, Daddy and Mammy and myself and my sister Mary came out on the bus and we thought we were going into the back of beyonds. It was so far from the city. And uh, the bus didn't actually come up into this estate at all. The, the, the nearest uh, play, nearest bus stop was actually in the village. So we walked up what's Wellmount Road. But when we were kids, that road was always called the New Road. Now, it was a name, it didn't stick, but it was, it was called, we always called it the New Road when we were kids. So I remember Mammy, uh, she brought out her best china on the bus. She was afraid anything would happen in the move. 
I came from a built up area, so I found it very hard to settle. It took me a long time, especially the bus problem, because you'd be going up the road for the 11 o'clock bus and you'd get to the top and next thing off it's gone. Like if you were a minute late or a half a second, it just went off. In 1957, I think it was, we moved out to Finglas, like a lot of people from the inner city. Although we weren't native inner city, but that's where I was born and grew up. And we moved to East Finglas, uh, Collins Place. It was a masonette because um, they're still there. But in those days, if uh, people were in a housing difficulty, the corporation gave you two years in the masonette. So the small two bedrooms, we were in number 15 upstairs. And then we got a house, great celebrations. I remember that morning. My mother, she got a letter from the corporation saying that we got one of the new houses on Glasenay Road, which was further down in East Fingers. And I remember uh, we were in her bed, I said, we're all singing songs um, because celebrating. And we looked at the map of the houses and it was a corner house, an extra celebration. So we moved in down there, no electricity. We had to uh, boil the water on the fire for uh, a few weeks. Some of the new residents of Finglas were less affected by the lack of electricity. Nurse Annie Killock is a well-known character in Finglas, having delivered over 1,300 babies in the area, including me. The cord was wrapped around my neck at birth, and I would have died had it not been for Annie's quick action. Her husband was an electrician foreman in Inchicore. The houses were wired, but they weren't connected up in a way. And he would, uh, at night time, when he'd been going home from work, there were some houses that he knew. And he wouldn't turn the light on for them, connect them up. And on his way in the following morning, then he'd disconnect them. But just today he'd be jailed. Such neighbourliness, whether legal or not, was typical of a sense of community blossoming in the housing estates as Finglas Village became Finglas Town. There was a great feeling, atmosphere in the village, like nobody would have... If you had a loaf and somebody else hadn't, you cut that loaf in half, you know, that way. Like the neighbour here, this side would help the neighbour on the other side and... There was no such thing as being stuck up or none of that. That didn't exist then at all. Everybody was in the same condition. Everyone was in the same boat, but people were kind. They shared everything. And they got these houses for us, you see. There's no, all the back end was just open. And, you know, my dad had dog and we helped each other. The neighbours built the fences. We all helped each other. That gardens were very long and was on their gardens. The idea of that was... People grow their own vegetables. And this was the idea why they got the houses with the land. I came up here 51 years ago. And I came up from Dundalk in the county I lived. And when I came here, and when I looked around me, there was no house around here at that time. Those were big green fields. But there was 10 of the Tiggians over here for travellers. There were tin homes, but they used to call them Tiggians. So we ended up getting them on the manual. And we sat her down in them. And I put the children to school. I didn't know I was going to stay here as long as I did. But I did. And we got here a lot of the um, settled people. They got to know us and we got to know them. And we made it up great with them. Because the travellers that time, the settled people, the settled people didn't want to turn around when they were travellers. But those old but Dublin people, it didn't matter. It didn't, it didn't take much aid of us. And we thought that was great. So we got great friends with them and with the people who wanted to chat with me all when we go to Mass. And we'd go on the Sunday at about two o'clock down to Patrick's Way. I got to like Fingless then very much. And I wouldn't live anywhere else now, only in Fingless. Living in Fingless back in the day, you know, we didn't have much in terms of uh, infrastructure, uh, shops. Um, eventually we had Super Quinn, and that was the first big one. Uh, H. Williams, uh, 
there was a number of shops started to build up. But when I was first there, we often depended on um, deliveries to the doors and you had the horse and carts that came with, you know, veg. You're, you had the milkman that came in the horse and cart. Um, you'd the rag and bone man. And dad used to love gardening. And we'd be sent out with the scoop and a bucket for the horse manure, for the roses and stuff like that. But in those days, I remember also the funerals going down the road, which again would either be horse or cart or the coffin being carried down the north road. Um, another memory I would have uh, would be the traveller uh, barrel top wagon wagons that would come down and there was it, their journeys were seasonal. And they came to Finglas every so often. I remember actually those days, uh, travel women coming around the doors with the swag baskets. And often I'd come home from school um, and mum and uh, a lady would be sat there and they'd be having a natter and a chat. And the swag basket would be there and mum would be buying bits of uh, cotton and, and needles and stuff like that. And you had uh, stuff in a basket, claws, pigs and fins and needles and... Brushes, hair brushes and things like that. Scrubbing brushes. To pick them into the basket and go through the houses and sell them. And he'd get a scrap. Because there was no work that time for the travellers. Our house seemed like luxury compared to where mum and dad had been living before. But times were hard for most people. And my parents were among many who needed help to get by. People who needed it did get help now. The Monsignor Glennon, he started dinners for the poor down at the bottom of the of the, the village. And uh, mothers and children would go down and get a dinner there every day and bring out sweet, the old-fashioned sweet cans with them. And that would be filled up with a dinner to bring home to those at home. Now, they were well, they were sure of a good lunch every day and they'd get bread as well. For a long time, we hadn't got much furniture at all in the house. That was something that was built up very, very slowly. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, we also availed of, uh, it was sort of a soup kitchen at times that was down, I think it was in Rosehill or nearby there. Other people will probably remember that. Um, at time, you'd be able to go down, you'd get uh, bread that may have been the day before as bread and stuff like that. And a lot of the neighbours and a lot of ourselves, you know, uh, they, we were dependent on those things in those days. Three bedrooms. Mammy and Daddy had the small box room. The boys, the four boys, had the big room in the front, two double beds. And the girls, three girls, had a bunk, be bunk beds and a single bed in the, in, the, in the middle room, if you like. So that's how we all fitted in. Uh, meal times were hectic because uh, the kitchen was very, very tiny. So... This room, the sitting room, was also your dining room as well. Uh, but we we ate very well. My mother was a very good cook and she could make food go a long, long way. There was a, a vegetable man used to go around um, several days a week and you could get your vegetables on tick for the week and pay on a Saturday. And I often remember my mother, not alone would she get the vegetables on tick, but she'd, she'd also get a shilling for the gas meter of the vegetable man and pay him back on the Saturday. There was a stew house down there at the end of, down the town, down in the village. And we used to go in there myself and a couple of friends. And she'd give us big cans of rice for the children and cans of soap. And they were very good to us. And then it was Saturday night and that Saturday night we go to the bottom of the hill to the pub in the bottom of the hill. And we'd meet a lot of friends and settle people there. And we'd go home with them very great. Women had to sort of make ends meet coming to the end of the week and things like that. But I think community was there and people borrowed off each other. They might have had food off each other. They lent each other something. And on my own road in Benevon, there was a little shop there called McCann's. And you put all your stuff on the book and you paid at the end of the week. So people helped each other. I still believe that people are helping, helping each other in Finglas today. The neighbours got together and formed what was called Wellmount Tenants Association. And you paid a few bob, not much, a little bit of money every week. And 
they bought lawnmowers, shears, ladders, and things like that. And during the summer, you could go up on an evening and borrow a lawnmower because nobody could afford to buy a lawnmower of their own. There was no animosity at all. Everyone looked after one another. You could knock at your neighbour next door, get a bowl of sugar or a cup of milk. You know, there was, there was great, great commodity there with the neighbours around the area. It wasn't a, a bad thought on anyone's mind. You know, you got everything done. Neighbours were neighbours. You could walk away, leave your hall door open, go into your neighbour's house. Mary, I'm looking for a slice of bread. Have you any bread? You know, and that was the things that were going on. They came on my time and then I started off then. I, I think I left school when I was about 12 and a half. As I grew up, our, our play area, if you like, was the countryside. And, and my, myself and my friends picking blackberries, bird watching, climbing trees, all of that was, was a huge part of our, our childhood. And, and as we got older, we, 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 we explored further into that, that, that countryside. And, um, and it is, I, I, I recently read Gabriel Byrne's book, uh, Walking with Ghosts. He grew up in Walkinstown and he talks about the same thing, that it, 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 it engendered in, in him a, a, a love of nature and the countryside. And, and I have to admit that that would have been my, my, my own experience. Patrick's well now. We used to do that as kids. Go down there and keep it clean, maybe take any papers that were in and out. Go up to the cornfields, walk around the cornfields. You don't see them anymore. There's nothing, nothing rare. The activities are that we had, we made them ourselves. You know, we have to make them for ourselves. We, we'd nobody to tell us, uh, well, you can't do that. We used to go off. Hikes, we call them. We'd go off today. You could hear cows uh, mooing. You could hear cows, because just across the way, there were fields. And that was the great thing about our childhood. We could go off for the whole day into the fields play, climb the trees, go down to the areas we thought were mysterious, we call them the Everglades. Now, the big problem with that was you weren't supposed to be there. And as being young, timid kids, or I was particularly timid, I was always afraid of the farmer coming along. Dick Deverell, or Craig himself, who never came near the place because he was a landlord. Um, so now and again, you would be chased off. And we were terrified of that, and it kind of spoiled it. But it was great to have that... Um, amenity, that, that, that countryside near, near you, the greenery, the trees that you, you wouldn't get in the, in, the, in, this, in the city or in a normal housing estate. So we had that for, for a long time until everything got built on anyway. I learned how to drive because it was either do that or, or um, be left behind and everything, you know, because it was a mile and a half, as I say, to the village and maybe you'd, there'd be something on in between bus times. So I brought them swimming and to the to the scouts, all that. I did did my best with them to give them a social life. Well, you saw them as kids did back then. You'd rob the orchard on your way home, just for the devilment because it was, it was the done thing. But I remember this man saw three or four of us down the end of the garden grabbing the apples and you used to stick your jumper in and you'd fill your jumper up with the apples and he came running down after us, came running down and we were jumping over the wall and running away and uh, he says, come back you little bastards, he says. And I stopped, stepped on my heels, stopped dead, turned around to him, looked up by him and says, I'm not a bastard, I know who my father is. And I... <laughs> Of course, we got up to mischief, <laughs> as everyone did at the time, you know. But uh, nothing serious, nothing that the uh, the police were ever involved in or could be involved in. So <laughs> we were good in that respect. We spent hours down the top. Now we bring our bread and jammers. And my no milk, bottle of water we bring with us. <laughs> Mama come down, Dad, if Dad was walking on the summer. They didn't got the money to bust this girl to hold her. We walked down to the botanic garden. The dad, for us, our growing family, decided to build a playground. And he made um, a slide. He built a hill up. He had a metal piece that went down. So that was our slide. But he also made um, a, a train, a, a train engine out of bits of wood and stuff with a little metal funnel that he made out of something, a tin or whatever, and he'd put coal in it 
and so you'd have smoke coming out <laughs> of this. And he built a sand pit with a roof over it, so we had sand there. And, uh, you know, a, a trail going round the garden. And then, of course, you had all the vegetables here. And I remember between my sisters and myself, we would have, <laughs> we would charge neighbours' kids into the back garden to have a go on our playground. I mean, we had a seesaw as well and swings and everything like that. Uh, unbeknownst to our parents, yeah, we were making a few bob on the side. My earliest memories are kind of, of just an open suburb, you know, and short trousers and primary schools and fields. We had lots of fields and honeybees and horses and and football. But th those are kind of those earliest memories, you know. Um, but and a nice, nice memory, you know. It's a warm, warm touch to it, you know. We used to play in the fields all around the site that time. And now hearing a word called heat field. There used to be big fields out there and we used to call it the bad man's land. So we used to go out there playing, chasing and we used to call it Bobby House and fighting and the things that used to happen out there with all the children. It'd be over the walls. We'd probably carry on ridiculous hour on the fields. But in the summertime then we'd leave uh, Fingless and we'd go and travel and we used to call it travelling. So we'd go to Cork, Limerick, Tipperary and say back down to Offaly and Cavan and the remembrance of that was absolutely beautiful. There would be a special school so it'd be just for travellers, boys and girls would be all mixed and they wouldn't, they wouldn't learn very much and I'd be let colour in all day so I didn't come out with very good education from primary school but really I went no further than primary school. But the teachers was okay, but I just thought maybe we felt ourselves, we were we knew we were different. You knew when you were in school that you were a traveller and you didn't like the name getting mentioned. So it was embarrassing. So we kind of just stood, stood to ourselves. So there was a stage then where to start kind of simulating the travellers from the special class then into the school. I still remember my teacher's name and... Miss Barry at that time, and I remember some of the friends I made in there, Settle Girls. There were various roads out of Finglas. There was the road which we called the back road that led over to um, Cardiff's Bridge and then on to Cabra. And then there was Dunsink Lane that led up to Dunsink Observatory. And uh, on our summer holidays, like we, we, myself and a group of friends, like would head off every every day, like and go on these treks, certainly up Dun Dun um, Dunsink Lane. Dunsink Lane was was beautiful back then. It was a, a, a chestnut lined road, and we would walk up that road and up to Conquer Hill, uh, right at the top of the road, opposite the observatory. On a clear day, if you stood on Conquer Hill, uh, you were looking right out, out over um, Dublin Bay. You could see Holt Head, Dublin Bay. You could see right out to the sea. And and that that, that hill is no longer there um, because they... Um, you know, they created a, 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 a dump there for, for, for many years, like, and, and, and it changed the whole landscape. While the housing estates were rolled out at lightning speed, amenities were often slow to follow, so the newcomers had to use their own initiative. In 1962, they formed WEFTA, which was West Finglas Tenants Association. All them people were ordinary working class people that moved out to Finglas. And they formed this great, wonderful centre then. They used to have a little outing in the Drake Inn on a Sunday morning to raise funds to try and communicate to get a building done. And they'd raffle off, we'd say, a bingo session. They might have a bag of spuds or a chicken. You know, things like that started off. And that's where they kind of started forming the association up. They used to pay a couple of quid a week. A shilling a week was basically what they paid to get the centre built then, as the centre was open in 1970. And shilling the week. But they had bus trips out of here going to Port Marnock, done about, out to Skerries, different day trips. And it was great, like the kids. Like part of them was you had to queue up, and it, so many people went on the bus. And then, like they had uh, in the 70s, then when they started, 68 actually, when the association started off the community games with the likes of Watkins Town, and I think Santry was involved in it. And the association met with Dublin Corporation as it was then and decided then that they put a proposal in that if people wanted to buy their own home, they could do so. And that was an agreement made with the association 
for people to buy their own homes. And then that's where the name changed from WEFTA to WEFTRA. It was West Finglas Tenants and Residents Association then, back in the 70s. Wellmount had their own little committee. Dunsink had their committee. Deanstown, in around that area, you know, Barry and Case and Mellows, they all had their own little small committees. And then the executive was here and it started off then there was executive members in the hall. So they come with the problems to the executive members and it's ironed out the problems. It's organised sports days out. You know, they'd have their sports, their own sports days. There used to tug of wars. There used to be a tug of war used to be going on. By the 1970s then, as the first generation of children born into the new Finglas town were coming of age, Finglas was finding its feet. So you had... Uh, these extraordinary juxtapositions that you had a modern suburb built on an ancient village, that you had kings, things going back to King William's ramparts and legends of St. Patrick, stories of St. Patrick and sort of various historical events. You also had Fingers being the Fox Rock of uh, Dublin in the um, 18th century because the air was very, very good above the city. So you, and you, you had old houses that were there and then you had modern estates that were there and you had that perpetual um, contradictions and juxtapositions of different things. So as a writer, you become quite fascinated by the landscape around you. You you have forced World War cottages. You actually have houses built like my parents' house in the 1940s. You had houses on the North Road. You had, And then you had this dual territory, like a massive scar cutting right through that community. And so uh, it, it, it was a very, it was a world I understood. And it was the world I wrote about. And I wrote about it primarily in three novels at the beginning of my career as a novelist. And one uh, is called Night Shift. It's the first and last book ever written about welding rods. And my first job was in Orlegan, which was a welding rod factory as part of the Unitor uh, complex. There was this move to, to get people very often out of school early. Get them a reasonable education and get them out of school early. And the expectation was always that you would go into a trade. Uh, and, and certainly that's where I went. Um, it's a bit like now, I suppose. There were jobs. And for the summer of 1972 and 1973, I worked in Fingless Laboratories, which is not there anymore. An interesting place. It's um, processed photographs, the ones you took and you have to send into the chemist and, and, and they did them. By the 70s, the families that had settled into the new states of Finglas East and West had put down strong roots. But Dublin Corporation hadn't finished building yet and there were troubled times ahead. Finglas West was, was developing, was developed. Finglas Celt wasn't. I mean, I remember the first image I have of Finglas Celt were these big walls arriving on the backs of trucks and all of a sudden a house was built, four walls, literally bang. And the fatal mistake at the time that they made with Fingless South, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with Fingless South, but what they did was they brought communities from all over Dublin and put them into the one area. And I think that was the start of Fingless South probably not going to plan.
JacquelineCreative.com